law that seems to apply to the, I want to say, piling on of the additional felonies and that they do not merge, which is the state's uh, position. I point the court to Noel versus the state, 297 Georgia 698, a 2015 case. And it says, in fact, what Ms. Donikoski's position is, that the additional felony murder counts will be vacated by operation of law when they involve the same victim. But in that case, there was as there is in this case, additional felonies, which in Noel, there was a question about whether the trial court should have also sentenced and not merged those into the felony murder counts, which were vacated by operation of law. I want to make a separate argument. This is the first time we heard of this this morning. I uh, know of no law that prohibits the court from conducting merger before the vacating of the op by operation of law. So in other words, if you were to merge the underlying felonies into the felony murder counts, and then those counts are vacated by operation of law, we don't even need to consider this. But in Noel, this Georgia Supreme Court case, this court concluded that the, court, the trial court had failed to sentence on the underlying felonies that were the predicates for those felony murder counts that were vacated by operation of law, but did not automatically say that the trial court erred in not sentencing on those. In Noel, the trial court, the Supreme Court ordered the trial court to make a determination, and I quote, whether the remaining non-murder felonies merge as a matter of fact into the felony murder conviction, and that that's why the case was remanded back. And interestingly, in the Noel case, the Hewlett case is cited, 296 Georgia 49, that's a 2014 Georgia Supreme Court case, same issue as before about uh, the felony murders being vacated by operation of law. And then there, but in Hewlett, it was a malice murder case as well. But it gave some instruction, and I suppose that's why the Noel court relied on Hewlett, gave some instruction about whether there would in fact be mur merger. And in Hewlett, the important distinction was whether the felony that then led to felony murder was followed almost immediately by the death of another. So the question wa was whether there was a, quote, deliberate interval between the offense and the death. For those reasons, Your Honor, I asked the court to find, as a matter of fact, that those felonies do merge and that there is no reason uh, and no statutory obligation for the court to sentence on the other remaining felonies that the state wishes to proceed on. So I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is there's no deliberate interval then because there are some other cases. Yes, I'm sorry, I just realized that I put that. Yes, that's what, exactly what I'm saying, Your Honor, that, there, that all of this took place in a continuing manner that there was no stop and start between the beginning of the chase, we'll call it, and the end which led to the tragic death. So for that reason, I think that it can be distinguished from some of the other cases that Ms. Donikoski may be relying on. Uh, but it certainly stands for the proposition that simply because the felony murders are vacated by operation of law does not mean that the underlying felonies have to be sentenced upon. They don't still exist. They don't, aren't still there. There still is a question of merger by operation of fact. Okay. All right. Between the two statutory sentencing options that are before this court, 
The state is asking for the sentence of life without the possibility of, of parole. And they made that position known back in September of 2020, specifically September 16th of 2020, when they filed a notice of the state's intention to introduce evidence in aggravation of punishment. And in that notice, Your Honor, under the final box that's checked, the state indicated that it intended to seek life without the possibility of parole by relying upon three statutory code sections, 1651, which is simply the murder statute, 1710-2, which is the statute of criminal procedure that provides for what we're doing here today, the presentation of evidence in support of any sentence that, the, that each party is seeking. And finally, 1710-6.1 is the third code section on which the state relied in seeking life without the possibility of parole. And in that code section, that is, as the court knows, sets forth the inability for any individual who is incarcerated for the first time on an, an aggravating uh, on a violent felony, which results in a sentence of life with the possibility of parole, to not be considered for any form of release or parole until after the service of 30 years in prison. Those were the reasons, the state said, we seek punishment of the defendant in this manner. And in the at the top of their notice of seeking aggravation of punishment, the state indicated in September of 2020 that they intend to introduce evidence of any convictions, juvenile adjudications, and other crimes of the defendant furnished as part of the reciprocal discovery. What the court knows is that there are no other crimes and no other pieces of evidence that support that statutory ground for seeking aggravation of punishment. So in the absence of that sort of evidence, which is the evidence the state indicated back in September it would provide, an absence, as the court knows from the bond hearing and having had those documents provided to it, there is an absence of any criminal history by Greg McMichael, which is a significant factor in your consideration of what sentence to impose. So, without any of the aggravating evidence that was set forth in the notice, the state has told this court now, we wish to simply rely on the facts of the case. And in particular, what Ms. Dunikoski ar argued is, number one, what she called a pattern of vigilantism. But every example she gave, Your Honor, was not, in fact, vigilantism, using gathering up folks who have no authority to do so and taking the law in your own hands. Her examples were notifications that Greg McMichael made to law enforcement about suspicious activity and suspicious people in their neighborhood. And in fact, that is exactly what a neighborhood watch program is all about. That's what Officer Rash testified to you we need, we can't survive without neighbors who will let us know what's going on and provide us the evidence we need to investigate crime. Very different and not at all related to some sort of pattern of vigilantism, which is a violent act. The second fact on which the state said that they were relying based on the facts of the case to seek an aggravation of punishment from a life with parole, meaning no consideration for anything less than 30 years, all the way up to life with absolutely no window of opportunity, is that Greg McMichael has shown no remorse or empathy. 
the difficulty of our adversarial system, a system that is the best system we know of, is that it still leaves no opportunity for an accused to turn and be the person you know he's been for 30 years, for 66 years, and offer condolences to another person for their sadness and for their loss. The other problem with the adversarial system that I know all too well is that an individual who is committed to telling the stories, to explaining to a jury how an individual got where they are right now often feels like a defense attack on the surviving relatives of this loved one. A vigorous defense often results in the sadness of people who have lost a loved one. But those are the roles that we honorably take on. Our remaining stoic in the face of heartbreaking testimony this morning from people who have lost a loved one is because that's our role in this courtroom. This court has very handily taken care of emotional outbursts to make sure that we're dealing with law and facts and not the kind of thing that can otherwise affect a court or a system that should remain free of those sorts of emotions. So, Your Honor, like Mr. Rubin said, it really isn't anything that I suspect the court will be taking into consideration the fact that Greg McMichael didn't and couldn't stand up and offer his genuine sadness and condolence for the loss of a loved one because he's facing other crimes. He's facing charges and trials on other crimes, criminally and civilly. And I hope the court knows that what we need to do to tell his story in any case involving justification, of which there was sufficient evidence to move forward with a request to charge, is that there has to be a clear, palpable, palpable full-throated explanation to a jury about how it is that an individual put himself in a place where our clients felt they had to defend themselves. It must be terribly difficult to hear when it concerns your loved one who's no longer here. And it probably feels cold. But the court knows those are our roles, and it's the only way to make sure that our system operates as it should. So, Your Honor, <clears throat> with no statutory aggravating circumstances, like in a death penalty case, how do you decide? We now know there are no statutory aggravators based on the notice. We now have told you about how the factors that the state said arise out of the trial actually escalate this out of life with parole to life without parole. I suggest to the court that we rely on a wonderful system that the federal United States Sentencing Guidelines set up and the United States Code, and that's you look at two things. You look at the nature and circumstances of the offense, and you look at the history and the characteristics of the defendant. Let's talk, number one, about the nature and circumstance of the offense. The best indicator of what happened in order to respect the jury's verdict is to listen to the jury's verdict. The jury found that Greg McMichael, as a party to the crime, committed felonies that unintentionally led to Ahmaud Arbery's death. After deliberating for over 10 hours, over two days, they came back with a unanimous verdict that says 
in effect. Greg McMichael did not leave his home that day hoping to kill. He did not view his son firing that shotgun with anything other than fear and sadness. What this jury found is that this was an unintentional act, one that Greg McMichael did not plan, devise, attempt, or seek to have the result that happened. So if life without parole is a sentence that is held for only the worst of the worst, it simply can't be a sentence for a person who never intended that tragic result that took place on February 23rd. If you never wanted another person to die as a result of activities you took place part in, you can't be the worst of the worst. Secondly, Your Honor, under 1710 the things that this court should consider, you should take in, in account extenuating or mitigating evidence that you heard in trial. Heard in trial based on the presentation of evidence over several days. Greg McMichael sought to detain Ahmad Arbery for one reason and one reason only. It was not for sport. It was not for evil. It was for the same reason that the police who repeatedly came to Satilla Shores came there for. It was to get to the bottom of Ahmad Arbery's nighttime intrusion into Larry English's house. The verdict spoken by this jury, based on their understanding of the law of citizen's arrest, found that Greg McMichael did not possess the information he needed to possess to attempt to execute a citizen's arrest. And that meant that Travis was not in a position to defend himself because he was the initial aggressor, if there was no citizen's arrest that could be supported by the facts and the law. That is the offense that you heard. A reason that is not an evil reason, not a reason of hate, not a reason of anything other than trying to help other people to get to the bottom of this inquiry. Further support of extenuating and mitigating circumstances from the trial, you saw in the video itself. As painful as it was to watch, I'm sure the court does recall that when you saw Greg McMichael in the back of the pickup truck, in the bed of the pickup truck, not directing, not doing anything that's going to be the person who's advancing the progression of this from the chase, the attempt to stop and detain Ahmaud Arbery into what it ultimately became, you most importantly saw that Greg McMichael never even sought to remove his handgun from its holster until after you heard the first shot. The first shot that took place in front of that pickup truck. So while he's on the phone begging for 911 to come and help, that is the moment he removed his handgun and never fired a shot. That is the nature and the circumstances of the offense that this court heard and upon which the jury reached their verdict. So now, the history and the characteristics of Greg McMichael. Because we know that history is the only reliable measure of a person's character. Greg McMichael is 66 years old. So, Ms. Donikoski, there has not been just 99 good deeds, but more like thousands and thousands of big and little good acts of kindness, charity, goodwill 
throughout this man's life. Greg McMichael is a good man. He's not a perfect person. None of us are. But he's lived a good life, a life dedicated to service. And that does count for something. The choices he made as a young man all the way through the rest of his life to serve, not to acquire wealth, not to do anything that brought extreme attention to himself, but to quietly go through the business of choosing career options to help other people. You heard at the bond hearing and at, during the trial of this case, Greg McMichael chose as a young man to serve this country by enlisting in the Navy. And after an honorable discharge, some years later decided to serve his community. Over 30 years in law enforcement. He was not a patrol officer, then later a detective, then later a detective, excuse me, an investigator with the DA's office because he sought power. There was no evidence of anything like that. There were never any complaints about him being aggressive, about him seeking to take matters in his own hands without seeking the appropriate backups. He was not a gun-toting, aggressive officer. His wife testified during the bond hearing. One matter of pride that Greg McMichael always had is that he never had to discharge his weapon during the service of his community. And of course, he wasn't a law enforcement officer or a an investigator for the DA's office for money. That's laughable. He did it to help. He did it to serve and protect other people. His post file that the court had into evidence during the bond hearing indicated numbers of commendations and notes from people in the community indicating how grateful they were for his willingness to participate in a case, for his willingness to go the extra mile, for his kindness to families of people who had lost loved ones. Things that are above and beyond the work that he needed to do. Those examples of commitment of empathy and kindness are further examples of who Greg McMichael is. He is a husband for over 38 years through thick and thin to the woman that he met and married months later. He's a son, a brother, a father, and a devoted grandfather. So yes, that's how I stand before you, Your Honor. Representing Greg McMichael, who has now been convicted of murder, and I say without hesitation, he remains a man of goodness. For 66 years, I calculated, that's 24,105 days of life on this planet. And we're here, not for a small matter, not as if, it, if all of the other erases what happened on that day, but we are here for a driveway decision to pursue a Mott Arbery and a five-minute chase that ended in tragedy. He needs to be punished. But how that contrast between a life of goodwill and service and the bad decisions that were made that day that resulted in a tragedy that the jury said unanimously he never intended could, be, could end up in the state seeking the sort of sentence that is devised for the worst of the worst is not consistent. 
In many courtrooms, Your Honor, that I appear in, right behind the judge, and it might be that way in, in Chatham County, there is the seal of the state of Georgia. And our Georgia state seal has three words on it. Wisdom, justice, but most importantly, moderation. Life without parole versus life with the possibility of parole may be nothing more than academic for a 66-year-old man with significant health problems because it means 30 years, at the very least, in prison. But it is an important distinction. It will affect all sorts of other things that could happen to Greg McMichael while he's in prison. But most significantly, it is the only way, Your Honor, to honor the jury's verdict that Greg McMichael committed crimes for which he never intended the result. For that reason, for the lack of evidence of aggravation, for the presence of significant evidence of extenuation and mitigation, we ask the court to sentence Mr. McMichael to life with the possibility of parole. Mr. Goff. Uh, Your Honor, we're going to need a short recess before we proceed. I need to triple check a matter. Okay. A five minute recess should be sufficient. All right, well, let's take a, well, let's make it realistic. Let's take a 10 minute recess and then we'll come back on the record at quarter two. Thank you.